On About Books, we delve into the latest news about the publishing industry with interesting insider interviews with publishing industry experts. We'll also give you updates on current nonfiction authors and books, the latest book reviews, and we'll talk about the current nonfiction books featured on C-SPAN's Book TV. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. And welcome to About Books. Now, in a few minutes, we'll take a look at how artificial intelligence might affect publishing and the writing of books. But first, Here's some of the latest stories from the publishing world. Former President Barack Obama released a statement in support of libraries fighting book bans. In his letter posted online, he said in part that, quote, books have always shaped how I experience the world. Today, some of the books that shape my life are being challenged by people who disagree with certain ideas or perspectives. I believe such an approach is profoundly misguided and contrary to what has made this country great. Well, the National Review pushed back on President Obama's letter, saying that, quote, when one digs into the controversies that have inspired Obama's missive, one quickly discovers that it is not so much that ideas and perspectives are being suppressed in America as that age-inappropriate material is being removed from its schools and in some cases from the children's sections of public libraries. In other news, layoffs and voluntary buyouts have begun at Penguin Random House. According to Publishers Weekly, CEO Nahar Malavia confirmed that long rumored layoffs have become a reality. Quote, As you know, the book marketplace has had several shifts over the past years, the Penguin Random House CEO wrote to employees. We too have experienced these shifts and changes, especially during the last month. We are halfway through 2023, and while the book market has grown, particularly over recent years, we have also faced significant increased cost in all areas across the board, and we expect these increases, as well as inflation, to continue. Well, approximately 49% of those eligible for a buyout have accepted it at Penguin Random House, including editors who have worked with authors such as Robert Caro, Steven Pinker, Elizabeth Gilbert, and Ray Kurzweil. And Publishers Weekly also reports that book sales were down nearly 3% in the first half of 2023 from 363 million books sold in the first six months of 2022 to 354 million sold so far this year. Publishers Weekly writes that, quote, the boost provided by Prince Harry Spare made biography autobiography memoir one of the only three adult nonfiction subcategories to have a sales increase in the first six months. Travel had the largest increase, up 6.6%. The two categories most closely associated with stay-at-home activities during the pandemic had the largest declines, as sales of home gardening books dropped 17.5% and sales of cooking entertaining titles fell 15.4%. And finally, in publishing news, Simon & Schuster is releasing a new memoir by Cassidy Hutchinson, the former special assistant to President Trump. She was a key witness for the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. The book's title, Enough. It's set to be released in September. Simon & Schuster said that in her memoir, Hutchinson reveals the struggle between the pressures she confronted to toe the party line and the demands of the oath she swore to defend American democracy. Enough reaches far beyond the typical insider political account. And now on About Books, a conversation with Thad McElroy, a publishing consultant, 
about artificial intelligence and its potential impact on publishing. Well, Thad McElroy is a publishing analyst and consultant. Recently, Mr. McElroy, for Publishers Weekly, you wrote an article that was entitled, Artificial Intelligence is About to Turn Book Publishing Upside Down. What are you positing here? Uh, that article's been fun. I've heard a tremendous amount of response to it. I've been pondering, like all of us, what's going on with this chat GBT stuff. And of course, with my background in book publishing, it was trying to put those, uh, uh, connect the dots, let's say on that. And when I connected the dots, I thought, gosh, this could be an enormous change in the industry that I've worked in for decades. And so I tried to push out there some of the ways in which it could affect all kinds of different aspects of the book publishing industry. So when we're talking about GPT, we're talking about generative pre-trained transformers. What exactly are those and how would they affect the book industry? It, it, it's fun how we get into the vocabulary because you'll hear about LLMs, large language models, GPT, as you just uh, described. Uh, we hear about generative AI and all of those are vari variations on a theme. For people who aren't familiar with it, it's, it, it you come up with a pretty straightforward basic non-scientific kind of uh, an explanation essentially a large database of language that when it's such a large database that when you pose simple english questions to it it is able to emulate a authentic sounding human response and of course you know if, if there wasn't a heck of a lot of data in there that response would just be stupid it would not make any sense whatsoever the database is deep enough that it comes up with very realistic reasonable kinds of responses uh, with surprising accuracy and surprising depth of detail and it can posit responses because of the size of the database and so when you work with chat gpt you start to think this is a, a device that's human-like that's in response to me and it does that most of the time what you hear about all the time of course is it's so-called hallucinations because it is really only trying to emulate language it's not um, releasing information per se and so when it emulates language sometimes it makes stuff up so mr mcelroy can we say that in the future, artificial intelligence will be writing books. I, I, it is doing so now. They're not very good books. I think they will be very, very good books, uh, both fiction and nonfiction created with artificial intelligence. I'm convinced of that. Now, where could, if somebody were interested, where could somebody read an AI generated book? the usual bookstore amazon well, there's quite a few books people i mean the ones that are up there now are a bit disgusting to me because most of them are sort of get get rich quick kinds of books um i don't necessarily recommend them. you can read free samples maybe that's the way to do it i wouldn't recommend spending money on it but keep an eye out you'll start to see some some pretty good non-fiction initially and then some pretty fascinating some non-fiction mostly i think fantasy and uh, romance, that kind of thing, will be very suited to the technology of GPT. And so if you're an author and you want to write a, uh, a book about fantasy and dragons, uh, what would you, how would you program that? Would you, would, what would you say to the computer or to the uh, uh, GPT? You would, um, it would be like a conversation with a friend. It would be like a friend helping you write a book. You'd start off by saying, okay, GPT, you're my co-author, and together we're going to work on a book. And I'm going to tell you little bits about the story, and then you're going to take the story, and you're going to expand on the story. I want you to give me 5,000 words. Our, our main character named uh, goes into the forest and runs up against a obstacle, da -da 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 -da, on like that, and GPT will iterate back at all kinds of different lengths and you can start to build the story. So in your Publishers Weekly column, you wrote that 
I believe that every function in tradebook publishing today can be automated with the help of generative AI. And if this is true, then the tradebook publishing industry as we know it will soon be obsolete. Is that a uh, pessimistic attitude or is that an optimistic attitude? I'm, I'm a total optimist. It, it might, it, when you pull it out in that kind of context, it sounds you know, dire and like a dreadful threat to the industry. I think that we're, I work in an industry that's you know, uh, very much bound by tradition, by a set of expectations, I suppose most industries are, but book publishing you know, has that aura of antiquity and is darn proud of it at times. And I think it's an industry that would be more robust with the uh, full use of technology, that, that we can get more voices, better voices to more readers using this kind of technology. I think that's a great thing. So besides being a so-called co-author, as you discussed earlier, how else would artificial intelligence change the publishing industry? In, in the article, I looked at all kinds of aspects of it. You know, I've worked in different parts of publishing through my career. So I've, I've worked in editorial. I've worked as an author. I've got a number of books published, no fiction, but lots of nonfiction. Uh, I've worked in production and printing of books, all of that kind of thing. I've worked in marketing of books. And so I, I consider each of those publishing areas and each of those functions are essential and need to be executed as robustly as each other. Each of them is very amenable to different aspects of the uh, power of the generative AI, some a little bit less so than others, but uh, I was able to you know, look at them each sort of in a sequential way and think, Yep, it'll touch that. Yeah, that one, it, it won't touch as much. This one, oh, goodness, it's going to completely re, 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 uh, redo how we're going to look at uh, simple editorial functions. Well, let's talk about the production of a book. How would AI affect that? Well, the production I think of as sort of, it's a multi-stage process within what we call production, but you know, let's assume that the manuscript has been fully edited. We've got the final words that we want to have uh, published. So at that point, we're going into a, a typesetting phase. Uh, we're going into a design phase, both the internal parts of the book and the cover, of course, of the book. If the book's illustrated, then we have to create a lot of illustrations for the book. When all of that is done, we go to uh, printing files that are ready for the printing press. Then we go to printing plates and onto the printing press. All of those stages at the design typesetting production phase, um, each one of them can be uh, accelerated and enhanced by AI. We've seen what it can do with images. So cover design is a, a no brainer even today with, with the current uh, state of the technology and that's only gonna get better. The interior design of the book, very, very simple to do with the help of AI. Th th those are some for instances. When it comes to distribution and advertising, you write in your Publishers Weekly article, for the publishing industry, online distribution and advertising have separated writers from readers. What does that mean? Yeah, this was something that's, so this one's close to my heart. You know, I, I'm, I'm a writer, I'm a reader. Um, and I've always been frustrated and a little bit dismayed, let's say, by the role, for example, I mean, Amazon gets attacked a lot, and I think there's much to criticize in Amazon. At the same time, it's brought a lot of books to a lot of people at some very good prices. But what it does in that act of, of bringing the books to people is it, as they say, disintermediates between the reader and the writer. And you, you can see that you know readers are very passionate when they come up against a good book and they fall in love with an author and the author's work. And then, but in between them sits Amazon in many cases. When, they, when it's a bookstore that sits in between them, that's I think a very good thing because there's a human interaction between the two. It's not disintermediated, it's accelerated and enhanced by those kind of personal relationships. So what I want to see, what I hope to see, what I expect to see with GPT is new ways for uh, writers to get to their readers and to communicate and to you know to find and enhance those relationships and vice versa for readers to find you know, even more books, even better books than they're finding today. When it comes to authorship, can an author claim to have written a book that's 
been co-authored by uh, generative um, uh, by GPT? That one says uh, that's the million dollar question and we're going to see a lot of controversy. We're starting to see it already. We're going to see that I think is going to play out through the courts eventually. There's going to be a lot of litigation around that. You know, if we take out the um, legal aspect of it, I can tell you that I've you know used GPT to help with my writing. I could tell you that I've created this whole chapter solely with GPT and then checked it myself to confirm that it's what I wanted. So GPT can be my co-author, literally, technically speaking, today. Whether or not I have to disclose that to the publisher, does the publisher have to disclose that to the public? What are the kind of moral and legal responsibilities about that? I think that's going to be determined over the months ahead and years, I suppose. So, Thad McElroy, you use the example of, of cars in your uh, Publishers Weekly column. Is it safe to say that we've become lazy drivers in the sense that we have power steering and power brakes and and some other features in our cars now that we didn't used to have, and writers can become lazy because they will have AI helping them? It's, it's a good question, and, and it's one that's you know, a reasonable question, and a lot of people are asking, and in, and in one scenario, that would be a, a kind of peril of this. Uh, I don't think so. I think that people, writers, are, you know, by nature, they're creative. They want to do the best they can possibly do for their own, you know, for their own pride and, and professionalism, and also because they want to reach readers. And so I think that GPT is not something that gets in the way or, you know, lessens that process. It's something that enhances it. I can be a better writer. I can do more research. It can help me with my uh, ability to express thoughts and ideas and creative ones or very, you know, literal ones. So it doesn't make us lazy. I think it's a tool that makes us stronger, more robust. Thad McElroy, how is GPT, how is it programmed? Where is it getting the information? Let's say we're writing a book about the 2020 presidential election and we're using AI to help us with that. Where is that information coming from? That's a tough question because it, 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 I'll, I'll try and keep it sort of basic. Um, one of the uh, aspects of the current generation of GPT is that the language, the, the, the um, information, let's call it the words that has been trained on up to now, you know, they cut off around, what was it, 2021, depending on the language model, they cut off a certain number of years. They continue to add to that so-called corpus of, of knowledge, of information. It's a, something's happening at the same time. You know, the, you're adding words to the database. Those words convey meaning, and they're, they're taken from web pages, from Wikipedia pages. And so those words are both, you know, individual, uh, I, you know, units of, of text, but they're also conveying information. They contain information. And so, you know, as, as GPT moves forward, we're going to see more and more um, current information, in-depth information. And some of that's going to be trained on books. That's one of the current controversies is that some of GPT is actually trained on books that have been published. Some of them, many of those books are in the so-called public domain. They're outside of copyright. Others, as it turned out in the current corpus, uh, have been books that are in copyright, and that's causing a lot of controversy. So we're seeing this already. We're seeing the use of AI, GPT, et cetera, when it comes to education. Is that correct? And students using, yes. using this, what's the danger there? Education is probably the most profound use case at this point. I was talking the other day with one of my colleagues who works as an, has worked in educational publishing. And as we began to you know, ca uh, go back and forth on what some of the possibilities are, you start to think, okay, a book of instruction that can be customized to the particular knowledge of the individual reader. You no longer have to have one textbook for you know the grade nine level. What you can have is a different textbook for every certain every single person in the class. You're seeing some of the online education uh, programs or uh, existing systems starting to use GPT and using it very effectively for one to one kind of tutoring. You can see a, a disintegration of the textbook as a form 
as the information becomes totally online and, and individualized to the student. So there it seems like GPT in the short term will have some of its biggest impact. Thad McElroy, one of the fastest growing parts of the book industry is audiobooks. Are we seeing computer generated voices reading audiobooks at this point? We sure are. And uh, just before the call today, I was reading about a, a company that's just uh, landed a very large investment and they do uh, uh, artificial intelligence enabled audiobook creation without a human narrator. Um, so some of your listeners will be uh, aware of this as a phenomenon because it's a couple of years old where we can clone voices from other people. There's an instance, a very famous, well-known instance now where the actor Edward Herman, who's no longer with us, his voice is being used to um, to narrate audiobooks, as it were. It's, it's, it's under license. It's been a legal use of his voice and sort of revenue to his estate, which is a curious aspect of it. But yeah, the, the AI is has gone from being a pretty good tool for this to being an excellent tool. A couple of years ago, when I first started studying it, you could tell it was still a computer. Today, very easy to convince someone that that voice is a human that was in the studio reading that book and no, it was generated very rapidly, very inexpensively with artificial intelligence. What is your company, The Future of Publishing, and your website, thefutureofpublishing.com? What do you do? I consult to all kinds of publishers, uh, to authors, to uh, distributors. I work on all of the technical challenges that the industry that the industry faces. I've been doing that for quite a long time. What fascinates me most is that intersection point between technology and traditional publishing. Do you find reticence when it comes to the publishers or authors? And I'm using a very silly word, but an ickiness to this? Yeah, yeah, I do. It, it, I talk about tech, uh, about publishing as a technology averse industry. It's not merely that the industry is not, and the average author is not terribly sophisticated around technology. I think they're intimidated by it, and that intimidation can become hostility, hence the aversion uh, aspect of technology. I you know, didn't wasn't born a technologist. I, my my entry into publishing was you know, the love of the creativity of, of great writing and technology was something that I picked up later on. And so I've, I've worked for a long time trying to make people more comfortable with the technology because it, it's, it's there to help, not to hinder. It's it's not something to block, but a, a tool that can make your, your work far more effective. Uh, but I understand where people who aren't comfortable with something with technology can be intimidating. I'm there to try and help them over the, the hump on that stuff. You close your publisher's weekly column by comparing AI GPT to the printing press and the transformation in the world by the printing press. Yes. Uh, it's you know, so many times when you read about technology or technology, talk to people about technology and publishing, they try to find a um, you know, something that makes it the biggest possible yet. And so there's, there's always, you know, this is the biggest uh, transformation since Gutenberg in the printing press. And usually that is pure hype. And, you know, most of the transformations of the last number of decades, you know, some of them have been very good, very useful, but they haven't been as big as the transformation of the printing press. This one could be. I, you know, I'm not convinced it is, and I recognize that's a, you know, a big uh, hill to climb to say, my God, you know, as as, as important as pre-printing press to post-printing press. Well, yeah, I, I like to contextualize it that way for people to consider that yes, indeed, this could be enormous. And if it's enormous, what does that mean to the work they do? Whether it is as an author or within a publishing company, if it was at that scale, what? What would the world look like right afterwards? Again, you know, if you consider the impact of the printing press, it's been you know enormously positive impact. Some drawbacks, but enormously po positive impact. I think it's it's equally possible that this generation of technology could be as profoundly and wonderfully impactful. Thad McElroy's website is thefutureofpublishing.com. His publisher's weekly article 
Artificial intelligence is about to turn book publishing upside down. Mr. McElroy, thanks for spending a few minutes with us to touch on some of the issues that may be affected by AI. My pleasure, Peter. Thanks for having me. And this is About Books, a program and podcast produced by C-SPAN's Book TV. Well, each Tuesday, dozens of new books are released. Here's a sampling. Child psychologist and author Miriam Grossman is out with her latest, Lost in Transnation, A Child Psychiatrist's Guide Out of Madness. Ms. Grossman testified at a hearing on Capitol Hill earlier this summer about her concerns about gender-affirming care and puberty blockers. And Donovan Ramsey is out with a new book about the crack epidemic and its impact on black Americans. It's entitled, When Crack Was King, A People's History of a Misunderstood Era. And another new book out is by former investment banker and financial commentator Carol Roth. It's her latest book, and it warns that global elites are targeting private property ownership and financial freedom. It's entitled, You Will Own Nothing, Your War with a New Financial World Order and How to Fight Back. And finally, one novel to tell you about. It's by authors Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray. It's called First Ladies, and it explores the partnership between Eleanor Roosevelt and civil rights activist Mary McLeod Bethune. Well, coming up on Book TV, it's our weekly afterwards program. This week, it's Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Wes Lowry on his new book, American White Lash, A Changing Nation, and the cost of progress. He's interviewed by Columbia University's Jelani Cobb. Here's a portion. If our country was founded on an explicitly white supremacist system in that people who were coded under law as white had claim to the full promise of American freedom, while people who were coded as black did not have claim to that promise, which is just the fact, it's how we were founded is what it looked like. The, that, that system is a white supremacist system. It's a system that prioritizes and places above others people who are coded as white. We've seen steps over our history to undo that and to create a multiracial democracy. We've, and those steps date back to the revolts of enslaved people, they date to the abolitionist movement, the Civil War, Emancipation and Reconstruction, they date to the Civil Rights Movement in the 50s and 60s, um, and they date to the steps towards the election of a black president. In each of those incidents, what we see is that as people fight to upend a white supremacist status quo, those who are the beneficiaries of that status quo lash out violently in, in defense of a system for which they are the beneficiaries. And so what we see is that following uh, the revolts of enslaved people, we see massive acts of violence in both interpersonal and in, in terms of policy, the cutting down on the ability of enslaved people to have access to reading or to education, their freedom of movement. Um, in some cases, quotas on how many new enslaved could be brought to a given colony to make sure that they would not lose an upper hand in terms of maintaining the populations. We see the violence and the backlash to the, the radical Republicans in the South and the overthrow of multiracial democracy as it was established in Reconstruction. We see the, the violent crackdowns of civil rights and civil liberties of black Americans following uh, the civil rights era and the civil rights movement. And we see the rise of these white supremacist groups, whether it be the skinheads, whether it be uh, the militia groups, whether it be what we called the alt-right for a while, right? This idea that when white, supremacists, when, when white supremacy is threatened, people lash out in its defense. And in those moments, I think those moments are best understood as a white lash. And a reminder that Afterwards airs every Sunday night at 10 p.m. Well, thanks for joining us for About Books, a program and podcast produced by C-SPAN's Book TV. You can watch all Book TV programs online anytime at booktv.org. And you can listen to this program as a podcast, download it on our C-SPAN Now app. Thank you.